Imagine you are the mayor of a booming Chinese city. The population of that city has doubled over the past 10 years. Thousands of new businesses are emerging all the time. And your biggest problem is traffic. All the roads are congested on a daily basis. Your people are struggling to catch a breath over the summer months. Pollution is reaching dangerous levels almost every day, especially when it's hot. You've invested massively in public transportation. You've built a new metro system. You've increased the frequency of bus and train services. But you can't find the solution. It's just not working. You call in the engineers, the mathematicians, the statisticians. They analyze the situation and they find out the capacity of the public transportation system is perfectly sufficient. Just people aren't using it well. The emerging middle classes who have become wealthier, they all want to be own their own cars, maybe even more than one per family, and they just don't want to go on the bus. It's just less convenient. It's just, it just doesn't fit well with their new lifestyle. What can you do? How can you solve this sort of problem? The kind, the technology I want to talk about today is a new emerging field within computer science and artificial intelligence called social computation. Now, this is not your Facebook or your Twitter. Those are valuable infrastructures that help people interact with each other on a global scale. I'm thinking more of the kind of systems where you combine human intelligence and machine intelligence on a global scale to solve some of the world's most challenging societal problems. These problems don't only occur, obviously, in transportation. They occur when we are faced with natural catastrophes. Think Fukushima, Haiti, political uprisings, the Arab Spring, the London riots. We've already seen that people can quite meaningfully use computer technology to support their communities in addressing these challenges. What we haven't seen that much is the role that computers can play and the role that artificial intelligence, maybe, can play in this. Now, I've been in this field for 15 years, and I can safely say a lot of the amazing things people can do, machines can't do, and they won't be able to do them for a long time still. People, people can do quite astounding things. They can perform heart surgery. They can create sculptures using landfill waste. They can write love poems to their hamsters. Um, computers are really bad at those things, right? But they're good at other things. They can organize data. They can analyze data. They can manage kind of the logistics of very, very large-scale systems. You know, hundreds of millions of users exchanging information every day on the internet. That's no problem for all the devices we're using. And, and we're using a lot of this technology. I don't need to tell you how information technology has changed all our lives. Um, probably every one of you has a smartphone in their pocket right now, and uh, they're tweeting about what a great event this is as I'm speaking here. And uh, <laughs> so it goes all the way, it goes all the way from these millions of small devices to some massive servers um, that uh, keep track of everything happening on the internet every day and um, are kind of uh, wait, sitting somewhere in the, in the desert in, in New Mexico or in Arizona and, um, and analyzing everything we do on a daily basis. So we are a society that computes. We, we compute a lot, not, not just machines. Even people compute, you know, when, when you make your decisions, when you think about what clothes to wear, when you um, decide what party you're going to vote for, you do that based on information, right? This information is given to you by the media, by the internet, by your friends, your families, um, and, and, and things you observe around you. This is 
all can be seen as computation, as processing information. So what do I mean by social computation? I mean the kind of computation where computers and people meaningfully complement each other. So where we take what machines do best and we bring it together with what people do well. I want to give you a couple of examples of how this could be done based on my own work. So, I've worked in artificial intelligence before, but now I'm more and more interested in applying ideas from that area to help humans. So, one of the founding fathers of computer science, Alan Turing, he very famously asked in the 50s, can machines think? Um, to be honest, I find that only a mildly interesting question. The in question I'm, I'm more interested in is, can machines help people think? Or, to take it even further, can people help machines help people think? Right? So I, I view this as the technology in engaging with humanity and humanity engaging with the technology and really trying to solve problems for which either of the two alone are insufficient, and um, there are many such problems. So, the two examples I want to talk about, one is, one is some work I've done on a hard problem which we've almost solved, another one is more speculative, but I find it equally exciting. So the first one is to do with thinking about this Chinese city and thinking about, well, what if we could have a very flexible and um, uh, kind of city-wide network of people traveling uh, with their different means of transportation and maybe sharing some of this, these means of transportation, not just carpooling where you get a, from A to B, but a system where you could jump on and jump off other people's cars, uh, join the bus, get a cab together, and so on. Now, obviously, if you think about millions of commuters in a city on a daily basis and all their overlapping rides and, and, and travels, uh, it's m the number of combinations you would get is simply mind-boggling. Turns out, by using some clever AI technology and some ideas from economics, game theory, and uh, also from machine learning, data mining, uh, we can sort of solve this problem. We can come up, given the travel schedules of everyone, where they want to go and when they want to go there, and where they're leaving from, we can come up with whole groups of travelers that can share their trips for part of the journey. And in doing so, more crucially, we can make sure we can make this journey attractive to everyone. So we don't know, we don't know how much people will value cost or time or comfort, or whether they like to be on, on, a, on a taxi with a, with, a, with a sweaty old man, or whether they want to be on a bus where there's lots of teenagers playing loud music. So, we've kind of solved the technical challenge, the, the, the computational problem of going through all these millions of different combinations and finding the best ones, those that look most attractive and that would actually help save, save energy and um, decrease congest congestion. But the hard part are people. How do we incentivize them? How do we reward them? Should we give them a badge every time they share a a car with someone else and don't travel alone? Should we give them a priority lane? Should there be discounts for people who travel, take public transportation together um, in order to, to then um, uh, pick up someone's car? So, so that's the hard part of things. So the second example I want to give you is somewhat wackier. So if you think about society, society is really good at doing lots of hard things by not relying too much on everyone doing the right thing at the right time. If a shop closes down, then provided that there is sufficient demand, a new one will open. If you miss the bus, you'll catch the next one. There probably will be one. Even if there isn't one, you'll get a taxi. It's more expensive, but there is some resource that you can make use of. And this is, this is what makes society so resist, resilient and so robust to change and to problem situations, to difficulties. 
So what I would like to do is I would like to build software, programs, intelligent programs that can make use of that same kind of ability. So the kind of thing where you could take away resources or people or add more and it would still work. Of course, it wouldn't work that well if you take more, more of the cars out of the city, nobody can drive around, but the, it would, the system would adapt to the circumstances. And I don't quite yet know how to do that, but I think the main idea, apart from strength in numbers, of course, if you have many people, they can help each other out, is to open these systems up to the creative thinking of people. So to, to enable people to co-design, to co-create these systems together with the computer side of things and to make them work based on the problems people want solved. So the closest example to that that I can give you is something like Wikipedia. So on Wikipedia, there is no central authority that tells people what to write about, what to read, and how to structure the knowledge that's there. There are lots of little programs, bots they're called, that kind of go through all that text that people are contributing and try to improve the structure and detect errors and so on. So what you're not seeing is the computation that goes on in the background, but the design of the system and the creative ideas that's what comes from humans. So, it is this kind of social computation I'm imagining, but I don't want, to happen on, I don't want it to happen on some website. I don't want people to um, just use their creativity to enable, um, I don't know, to enable you to print your Instagram pictures on marshmallows, right? So, this is something actually that a company in London does. Um, <laughs> but, and they're making money. So, you know, those are all great ideas, but I want, I want these systems to be used in such a way that they interact with people's daily lives, right? So, you want someone to help you out with your babysitting. Find them online and maybe trade a favor for that. Um, you are interested in going on holiday with a bunch of people who have the same interests, or even just to get a discount from a hotel by booking the whole hotel. Right? Do it together with them. So, because these, the way we're globally connected enables us to solve problems and to approach problems in a different way than we used to, I think we stand a good chance of solving much harder problems and not just travel and marshmallows, but the hard problems, you know, poverty, disease, um, economic problems, the um, helping the disadvantaged. And I think, I think that by combining intelligent computer systems with people and by involving people in their creation, we can achieve that. Before I finish, I want to kind of raise a different issue though. We're all kind of exposed these days on a daily basis with the ever-increasing pace of technological change. It's very easy to be kind of swept away by that and to get very excited and enthusiastic about all the new opportunities that are being opened up to us with, with every new thing that, that appears, um, especially in information technology and computer technology. In fact, what I've been talking about is very much along those lines, right? I'm telling you technology will help us solve problems. But it's easy to forget one aspect uh, when one thinks about these kinds of opportunities, and that aspect is power, right? So the people who build these systems exert power, the people who deploy them, the people who use them to a certain extent um, also hopefully are empowered, but of course not everybody is empowered in the same way and not everybody has access to all these systems. So this is ultimately a political question, right? This is, this is a question that we need to address as a society. We have technological means to make, to create social processes that are new, that are different, and we're capable of 
giving people work in, in things that we couldn't before, um, helping them with their family problems, with their, with their financial problems, creating new communities. But we must decide on how we want to do that and, we, and keep this debating and deciding as humans. Technology is not going to help us with that. Do we want the mayor of our Chinese city to be some sort of benign dictator who knows what's good for everyone and therefore forces everyone to leave their car at home and take the bus? Do we want her or him to be a clever social engineer who kind of nudges people into wanting to do the right thing just by convincing them or giving them incentives and rewards? Do we not want the mayor to make the rules at all? Do we want people to make the rules? And in that case, should the people without cars make rules for the people with cars? All these are questions that need, require an answer. And no intelligent, no artificial intelligence in the world will give you that answer. Um, this answer can, has to come from people, and as technologists, we have to be very aware of these questions and we have to engage with them. And I think the best way to do that is to engage with you guys, with, with the people who are the future users of these systems and the stakeholders who, you know, you, you want to use these technologies to serve your own needs and the needs of the communities you're part of. And I think it's very important to remain optimistic, to, to see the opportunities. But while being optimistic, always also keeping a critical view on things and a critical eye when you see that the next um, thing that's going to save the world is just around the corner. Thank you very much.